everybody. Welcome to Rachel's Reviews. And this is our next episode of the Female Film Critics Speak Out panel. So much fun, something we've done every month for the last like year and change. And uh, I've always loved getting to talk to my fellow female content creators and YouTubers and female film critics. It's so much fun. And I am film critic Rachel Wagner and I have two special guests with me today. I have Jennifer Vegas here. Hi everyone. And Lauren Knight is here. Hi. Yes. Thank you so much both for coming. And I'd just love for each of you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the content that you make and how you got started uh, in movies in this, uh, in this, how you got started analyzing film and talking about movies. And Jennifer, why don't you start? So I still consider myself to be pretty early in the film critic stage because I honestly started two years ago, but just now I'm actually starting to do it, I would say more professionally because now I'm actually majoring in film and I'm learning a lot more in that aspect and I'm applying that to my reviews. But it, this all just started because I loved cameras and I love talking about movies and then I just joined the two and I made a YouTube channel that you guys can find Jennifer Vega. And I love to review all sorts of things, new things, old things, and I love especially reviewing horror movies. And now I'm starting a podcast myself called Behind the Movie, which took a little bit of a break, but it's back now. And it's all about just behind the scene facts because I also think the process of making a movie is one of the best parts of just film in general and yeah there's a lot more coming in my film criticism journey and I'm just really happy to be here and yeah yeah thank you so much Lauren what about you um I had sort of a very roundabout way uh I'll try and be brief I actually have a broadcasting degree um and I minored in English but I took so many film classes that I was two credit shy of graduating with a double major um, and every film student saw, thought that I was a film major because they kept seeing me in all of their classes. I was like, no, I'm just here on an elective. Um, so I got my broadcasting degree. I worked for the Weather Channel and CNN and then moved out to Phoenix and worked in some newsrooms um, for some radio stations and stuff out here. And then uh, did not love that anymore. News was not what I wanted it to be. So I did PR for about a year as I was trying to sort of figure out like, what else I was good at and like apply my skill set. And then I was volunteering with um, a uh, local filmmaker. He has since moved out of state, but with a local filmmaker out here trying to help promote his films and like volunteer at his screenings and things like that. And uh, there was a job opening for a film programmer. Um, there were going to be some Alamo Draft House cinema locations opening up out in Phoenix. Um, and so I applied to be their creative manager, which is basically they're just programming and events coordinator. Um, and I got it. <laughs> so I've been a film programmer now um, for the last five or so years, first for the Alamo Draft House, and then now for um, the Majestic Theaters. Wow. So when you say film programmer, what does that actually entail? What do you do? Um, it's literally anything that doesn't involve first run features. Um, so whether it's, it's classic films and like the repertory titles, whether it's having, uh, Skype people, you know, like Skype screenwriters or directors, you know, do a Q and A or having someone live on site, uh, do a screening and a signing, um, it's lobby activation. So sometimes it does involve first runs, but it's finding a movie and then tying something in, whether it's like decorations or whether it's doing like arts and crafts with kids for, you know, Frozen 2, things like that. So it's it's everything that's that's public facing and, and on sale to the public um, is is what I do. And so there's like probably there's you were probably actually pretty busy in 2020 because there was so many classic films coming once the theaters are open, at least. Uh, yes. So many curated films. <laughs> that was almost all we had. We yeah. showed some smaller stuff, you know, that had come out like Kajillionaire. Um, but it was really just, you know, please come see the Goonies again, this time in a theater, you know, that type thing. Um, yeah, it's been interesting. Jennifer, what about you? You've been taking these classes and I was thinking I never did. I never took a film class in college. And do you feel, because sometimes I feel like I don't know. Like they're not, they don't really give you very good films that you watch. Because it's like the teacher's biases are so obvious. Uh, it seems like my, like at least my brother, he took a film class and I thought it was such a weak group of 
movies that they asked him to watch. Uh, I don't know how you felt about going to film school. You feel like you've gotten some pretty good classes. So, so far I've only taken three classes because I'm also a double major. I'm also doing advertising. And on top of that, I have an art minor. So like I have, I'm, I'm not just on a film, on a film schedule, but so far I really like them. Um, I took a screenwriting class and I thought it was really good because I'd personally never written a screenplay before. And personally, I thought my professor gave us really excellent just books to read. We didn't really watch that many movies in that class. We saw Jerry Maguire, which I had never seen before. And I really liked that movie. We saw parts of La La Land, which I also really liked that movie. And I think, we, yeah, we saw, yeah, it was in that class. We saw a bit of A Star is Born in that one to just analyze emotion and also just how to use music in, in film. And personally, so far, I think my classes have been really good. I've also taken a production class. And in that one, we studied a lot of Hitchcock in that one, which I thought was really interesting because I, I'm telling you, like just film school has opened my eyes to a lot more. And now I'm really excited because this semester I'm taking History of International Cinema which I'm so excited to dabble into that. But personally, like so far, I think I've gotten a pretty good education. I'm starting now, like I'm just gonna be a sophomore now. So I know there's a lot of more classes to take. And in my school, how I'm kind of dividing it is my film major is production and half of it is critical studies. And in critical studies, there's a lot of classes like I'm taking a horror movie class from the 70s, 70s horror films this semester. And it's actually taught by a local Miami film critic. So I'm very excited to take that and like take notes from him. And yeah, so far it's been pretty good in my opinion. That's great. That's really good. So Lauren, I wanted to ask you, your Twitter handle is that movie is fine. And so I'm curious to learn more about this. Do you feel like you tend to think movies get too hyped that you're just like, it's fine. It's um, I think a lot of them, look, I think it's totally fine. And we should normalize the fact that a lot of movies are fine. Yeah. Like, I don't, I think that's totally healthy. I think that's normal. I think it's a more balanced way, I think, because instead of just like, you have to say that it's good or you have to say that it's bad. I think it allows for nuances in between. And I think it applies to a lot of films just because I think a movie is fine doesn't mean I don't enjoy it, yeah. right? But I feel like playing catch up on some movies, I missed a lot of movies in the eighties cause I was born in the eighties. So like, you know, I was more the nineties movie watcher. So trying to catch up on a lot of eighties movies, people have nostalgia for these movies. And I totally respect that. I have nostalgia for wild hearts can't be broken. That was a sl like sleepover <laughs> staple. Like hey, that's that not movie, fine. That's a great movie. That movie is fine now. Like as a grown up, like I still love it, but yeah. like, I totally understand if someone's like, what is this? And I, I get it. So I, <laughs> by catching up on a lot of movies that people grew yeah. up with, or for example, the Goonies, which I didn't even see until I was, in my 20s working at Hollywood Video or late teens working at Hollywood Video, they're fine. And that's great. Movies can be fine. <laughs> a lot of movies I love are just fine from just like yeah. a movie standpoint. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing I wish that people would understand about Rotten Tomatoes is that there are so many movies where I'm like, mm. <laughs> like, am I leaning positive or leaning negative? Like. I don't hate them. They're fine. And yeah. I'm trying to decide whether I should go fresh or rotten. And really, it's hard. It's really hard. I would say about mm, at least half, and that's probably being generous, movies are just average. And I'm trying to decide how I feel on, on them. And it's challenging. And so then when people see that, like, I gave something uh, I gave something a four, I mean, I'm like leaning negative, or I gave something a six, which means I'm leaning positive. It doesn't mean I, I either I'm in love or hated either one. They're about the same. <laughs> I, and I, like, I, the fact that something has to be either A or F, right? Yeah. I don't think that that is fair to the film either. And I mean, have a me having oh. a mediocre movie, you could argue like, you know, a lot of movies these days are clearly just passing, you know, mm -hmm. like not a lot of, but like movies can be fine. And I think that that's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jennifer, so I do notice that you, you have quite a bit of variety on your channel. 
you have uh, reactions, you have horror, you have rankings, you have tier. Uh, you, I really liked your Oscar movie mashup. That was very well done. And so Thank I'm just you. curious how you get ideas and what you decide to cover and how you decide to do it and uh, how you, what's your process like? So basically when I started my channel, like it actually started as an art channel, like my very first videos, because I'm also an artist and I wanted to change the name so many times. Like I wanted to do Jennifer reviews, Jennifer ranks, like just a lot of things, but I decided to just put my name, Jennifer Vega, because it's just things that I enjoy. For example, when I did my tier ranking, randomly, I just decided, oh, I want to tier rank what I watched this month but it doesn't necessarily mean that my channel is a tier ranking channel. I just, I love film and I love so many aspects of it. Like I love doing movie reviews and now I'm trying to just branch out and do a lot more interesting videos with them. I'm planning to do a, a, a video soon where it's just me kind of documenting, watching a lot of Marilyn Monroe movies and de like just talking about that era of like when she was an actress and like the movies that she did and just topic videos. I still enjoy doing reviews a lot. And usually when I review a movie, I tr I'm trying to be better at reviewing movies when they come out because I don't get as screeners as often. So it's sometimes a bit harder for me to get to the theater and like do a review ASAP. But I'm just trying to make videos that like I want to make in the moment and my creativity comes like I can't even I don't even know it's just randomly I'm like oh I want to make this video so I'm going to make it about this certain movie and stuff and thank you so much for saying that you liked my mashup video because I actually started getting really into making videos because I've been editing since I was in middle school and like on my little HP laptop and then now I have a MacBook where I edit more I love doing film edits I used to have a film edit account back in the day like on Instagram it's no it doesn't it doesn't exist anymore but I just love like editing and yeah I just I just want to make a lot of videos I don't want to just limit myself to one thing and yeah that's awesome I love it I think that's really cool and have you gotten any sort of pushback about being a female content creator or female voice particularly in the horse horror space I don't know it can be there kind of was once I got a DM on Instagram and it was when I did my 31 Nights of Horror series and it was for the review of Killer Clowns from Outer Space of Outer Space. I always forget the name. I don't like the movie. And I just said that I didn't like it. And then they said that like, obviously I wouldn't like it because I wasn't born in that time and it wasn't made for me. And then I was just like, <sighs> I just hate when people say those things because especially like since I'm way younger, like, I like what Lauren was saying. I don't have nostalgia for a lot of movies. And like, just because I don't like a movie that was like a, an old movie doesn't mean that it's because I just don't get it and that it wasn't made for me because I think a good movie could be able to just be watched by any audience. Yeah. And that's kind of, I haven't gotten too much hate and stuff, but sometimes, especially when I was starting, it did feel a little bit scary to put out my opinions about horror movies just because it's so dominated by men especially the horror genre like every like ever since I was little and I would watch reviews like it would just be like guy after guy after guy and like when I started I was definitely a lot like less confident in my thoughts and reviews and I will say that sometimes I did appeal to the mass audience because I was like scared of getting judged for a, an opinion by like from like a 17 year old girl when I started because the internet could be scary but like yeah. I feel like now I'm like a lot more confident and like it's my opinion and I, and I trust my opinion. And if you don't, then that's fine. So, yeah. That's really admirable. Cause even today I'm for, I'm 40. So <laughs> I, even I have, I have uh, moments where I'm like, I'm nervous about putting yeah. this out. Uh, but you know, you just gotta trust your friends that they'll, they'll back you up and trust your voice. And that's why a lot of times I end up writing my reviews as opposed mm -hmm. to uh, doing YouTube videos, because I just feel like the, the, the blogging space is so much more positive. And also I just feel like I'm a better writer than I am an orator. And I'm good at leading discussions, I think. Well, good uh, at leading discussions and, and podcasting, but, uh, but I, I think I'm, I'm at my best in writing reviews. And so especially anything that's like slightly controversial, I'll just stick to the writing, yeah. not YouTube. Cause YouTube can just be the worst and it's yeah, hard. It's Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be really, really scary, especially because I look at my analytics and like most of my audience is men. Mm -hmm. And then like, I'm, I'm going to be honest, like most of the people that watch my videos are the nicest people ever. And I love everybody that watches my videos, but I'm like scared sometimes because I'm like, oh my God, like I'm, I'm just, 
yeah i'm just scared even in my film mm-hmm. classes that's mostly men i'm scared to voice my opinion because like i have some unpopular opinions where like they're considered cinema sins but they're considered cinema sins because a guy randomly one day decided that 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 was just like the best thing ever and then now everybody has to follow that rule in movies and then yeah it's just yeah. it's scary but i think i've gotten a lot more confident with it where like i try not to let it get to me like if you just don't agree then fine just it's your issue not mine because mm-hmm. i don't mind if somebody disagrees with me so yeah. yeah lauren what about you you being in broadcasting and, and film programming like how have you had to work to kind of build your confidence like that Definitely. Uh, I did not have nearly as much confidence as Jennifer had at her age. I don't exactly know how old she is, but given by like college and being a sophomore. So definitely early twenties, I'm assuming, but I did not have nearly that much uh, confidence. So Jennifer, like I applaud. I still don't know if I have all that much confidence anymore. I'm just older and don't care. Uh, (laughs) uh, Rachel, you get it. You're just like, uh, I don't have time for this. Um, uh, yeah, I would say hmm, it's hard. So I did broadcasting in Atlanta and broadcasting is still, uh, male, at least when I was in it, like there are a lot of, you know, male broadcasters. Um, I found that being sometimes being good at your job ends up with a target on your back just as much as like maybe not being good at your job ends up with a target on your back or people just keep piling more like their stuff on you because like you don't say no and you just like keep doing it and because mm-hmm. you want to be a good employee and you want to get promoted or something like that. Uh, I would say being in broadcasting and working with a whole bunch of personalities uh, on one show was really, really helpful um, and actually sort of helps me now with programming when I'm either interacting with guests um, like just uh, like the movie goer or uh, Hollywood professional guests, sc- directors, screenwriters, I'm able to adapt my personality based on how, how they are, what they need. Like some people are more shy, you know, than others, or some people might have more, more demands than others. And I think without compromising who I am, I'm able to, uh, I really love people as much as I might like complain about people I really do love people and I think um working in broadcasting really helped because you you would get berated like the control room's a scary place um you know and and more and more stories come out of of being like yelled at and stuff in and it's like what other setting could you be yelled at in the workplace right it's live tv like live tv is where you get berated the most because it's visual so if someone doesn't cue like the right you know, like the proper lower third, uh, like it, you know, it's, it's awful. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. Sorry. Yeah. I'm rambling. No, no, that's good. Yeah. Could you relate to some of this, some of the stuff in bombshell, like the sparkly lipstick and things like that? Um, I could, like obviously I not could as extreme, a, but right. I could to, to a degree, um, there is, there is an expectation for, for female, uh, anchors and reporters, um, mm-hmm. that isn't there for yeah. me. I bet. Uh, so one thing I like to always ask for this, uh, s- series is, uh, to talk about the need for female voices in film, because one person might say, well, a review is a review. It doesn't matter if it's written by a woman. It doesn't matter if it's written by a man or, or, you know, YouTube, YouTube review. Uh, but I, I personally think that it's good to have lots of different voices and it's something that we don't see enough of. That's why I wanted to do this series so that people were aware of all the great female critics and YouTubers and content creators and everything that are out there. But uh, what do you think, Jennifer? Do you think that it's important that we have female film critics uh, and, or, you know, is it a review or review? I so disagree with a review is a review because like you said it, like it's just, it's perspective. When a good film how you know that a film is really well reviewed is that there's a lot of different perspective from people of color different sexualities different genders like you just get a whole rounded picture because if it's just for example if it's just men reviewing a movie or if it's just women reviewing a movie solely you're not going to get all the different points of view because right now us three sitting here we could talk about one movie and we each have something to add about it talk about it 
because we each have a different experience with it and that's also what a review is and like I always go back to something that Brie Larson said that I love and a lot of people took it the wrong way she said I think it was for the movie A Wrinkle in Time that the movie was like the movie wasn't being talked about enough by people of color and the movie was made for them in a way and she said that like it, it, it's just like it's kind of just how I view in the heights now if it was only like as as being a Cuban American if, if if like I wasn't a critic before this and like I only saw the lens from like a white person talking about this movie they wouldn't be able to add certain things that I could being Cuban and being like oh this movie did this really well because it highlighted our culture correctly it's just lenses are so important and that's why I think there should be so many more female critics and I love this series because I have found so many more female critics before because like it can sometimes I don't know if you guys can relate feel isolating because it did for me at the beginning where I was like I don't have other female voices to like back me up on this and like talk about the same thing together because like obviously even as females we have different opinions we don't all just have the same brain but like we do add certain things that men can't add and that's just how it is it's just and also like I think we also review different types of movies as well like movies and movies and genres don't have gender but a lot of females cover more rom-coms like you Rachel you cover a lot of Hallmark movies and I used to watch a lot of Hallmark and I could not find any review of that like on YouTube and then you have like the podcast and like you just have a whole entire different lens that like like males just wouldn't normally have and that's why I think it's important to have like all different types of voices from females. I especially think it's important when you're talking about something that was specifically made for women exactly and if we yeah. don't have women saying is this quality is this exactly. good some critical analysis on it then it can just be whatever there's no sense of uh ownership or critiquing or anything that mm-hmm. uh, i mean i want homework movies to be good i want right. so i i that's why i provide critical analysis of them mm-hmm. because i exactly. want them to improve and keep being better and uh, so i think it's really important especially i remember when uh, bridgerton came out I was watching it. I'm just like, this is so clearly this move, this series is made for women. Just everything about the way it was shot, the way the like the female gaze in it was. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought it seems ridiculous that uh, that men would review this. It's so obviously made for women. Of course they can. I'm yeah. not saying they can't, but I'm saying that that we need female voices for something that was so obviously made for women. And <laughs> I think it's, I, I agree. I think that's really important. And I I think that it was really important for me to start this series because uh, I, I had a huge backlash when I didn't like Shazam and the, uh, the, um, uh, the fandom went crazy. And it really rocked my self-confidence because, you know, I just thought that I could handle anything. And then that happened and right. it, it really, it really was hard for me to kind of have the confidence to to put out my reviews again for for those kind of fandom things like with um birds of prey i was really nervous about even though i ended up liking it i was really nervous about reviewing it and uh, so that's part of the reason why i wanted to, to start this just so that i could gain my confidence back and uh, from that experience because it's nothing like there was there was nothing like that kind of intensity when like the fandom really comes at you hard. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what do you think, Lauren, as far as female critics? Um, I mean, I agree with with everything Jennifer said. Um, I think I see a lot of people on online will say, well, this movie wasn't made for me. And it's like, that's fine. Like, that's OK that a movie wasn't made for you. And they say it in such like a disparaging way, right? Mm-hmm. Like. Birds of Prey was not made for straight <laughs> men. Like that movie wasn't made for you, right? Um, but I think I think it's important to have to have all voices. Uh, In the Heights is a great example. I saw it when it toured years ago, like the you know Broadway tour kind of thing. I really enjoyed the movie, but I'm also aware that there's a large part of the. Uh, Latinx, uh, Latin, Lat, sorry, Latin A population. I don't know which, you know. No, it's uh, kind of a little confusing. I know with the, I know the Latino community as a whole 
uh, so, some people really liked it. Uh, Jennifer, it sounds like you did as, as a Cuban American, but I know that representation of, of you know, darker skinned uh, Latino people was, was lacking from that film. And so I, I, you know, it's, it, I did like it, but I'm also a, a, a white woman. So I, I'm no. trying to be cognizant of how others feel and, and we're never going to agree, right? Like, like uh, a lot of, of Latin American critics are never going to agree with other Latin American critics because, you know, it was representation for some and then not enough representation for others. And so I think, I think it's really important. I also think in addition to multiple uh, voices, gender, sexualities, people that write reviews for movies that they don't already enjoy the genre of, does everyone a disservice? And you see that a lot, Jennifer, with horror. You see a lot of people yes. who don't like horror writing about hereditary. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely, or people that don't like comic book movies reviewing Black Widow. And it just, it does everyone an absolute disservice because these, these, they're never going to like whatever yeah. these movies are putting forth. It's tough because sometimes they have to for their outlet and they're required to, but, but I try when, when I end up reviewing something that's outside of my preferred genres, I, I try to ask the question of what are they trying to do and did it succeed in doing that? That's what I, you know, so if I'm watching, like, I'm going to be reviewing Paw Patrol coming up. I'm not going to be looking that from the perspective of 40, me, a 40 year old, like I'm going to be looking at it from pre-K. Is it, is it cute for little kids? I'll probably take, you know, my friend and, and, and her little kids and see how they respond and try my best, you know? So, cause the idea of, of, of ranting and raving about Paw Patrol is just ridiculous. Like it's that movie for wasn't made very for you. little children, like younger than kindergarten. <laughs> and yeah. it might be it might be bad for pre-K. Like I might watch and be like, no, this doesn't engage children. It's not a good film. Uh, and that's fine. But I'd at least try uh when there is one of those ones that's kind of outside of my genre, I guess. No, and I you're doing reason like you're gonna use children as a gauge, not you as a like, and that, that's important. It's just, really, you can't find anything. Hereditary was beautifully shot. Let's talk about the cinematography. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about the symbolism. Like, but instead it's just, uh, it's a horror movie. It was really slow. Like, I didn't get it. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It, it's so yeah. annoying. Yeah. It's just like, you don't even give the movie a chance. Just don't, just don't. Right. Yeah. You're biased going in. And I think mm -hmm. that's a problem across, like across all, all types of genres, comic books, mm -hmm. horror, whatever. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about the new sort of streaming uh, wars that we're having versus like seeing movies in the big theater? Are you on the big screen? Are you, do you feel like this is a chance to kind of get more uh, voices? Because that is definitely true. Like things that wouldn't have been greenlit in the 80s and 90s are getting greenlit now. Uh, and we're hearing from all different perspectives with the streaming wars, but it's also hurting our uh, our in theaters and that whole experience. Uh, what do you think, Jennifer, about that? I'm all for movies going to both theaters and streaming for now, just because I think now, especially with coronavirus cases going up again, like I think there are people, there was a time where I didn't want to go to the theater even when they were open here in my area just because I didn't feel safe. So I liked having the option that movies could go to streaming. And I have actually found a big love for streaming recently. I'll always be a big theater. Like I just love the movie theaters. There's nothing like it. I would for sure love to see Dune on the big screen rather than in my home TV, just because I think it's an experience. There's movies that are just experiences. But I have found like so many movies on streaming that are really good that I probably wouldn't have seen if I had just been going to the movie theater, like Netflix originals, just Hulu originals, like just so many movies and even movies that I didn't like. Like I just, I just, I've been browsing on streaming services a lot more and there's like a lot of movies out there that a lot of people don't talk about that are found on these services. And I'm personally a fan of it. Also, I kind of look at it in a lens that like my theaters are a lot emptier and it is sad, but sometimes when I would go see a movie and I think we've all experienced this, there's people on their phones, there's people being super annoying. And I've seen less of that because there's movies 
on streaming just because I kind of think of it if you're going to be on your phone when you're watching a movie those people might stay home like that's kind of the logic that I'm thinking about because I've seen way less people be using their phone at the movie theater because I'm thinking if there's an option the people that really do want to go see a movie at a movie theater are going to go and that's been my experience so far yeah I'll never forget I was watching Secret Life of Pets the first one Uh and this little girl was just coming up and down the stairs up and down the stairs and I don't know what her caregiver was her guardian whatever was was thinking and not stopping this but then she just sits down because I was on the end of the row she sits down next to me and she's just chatting with me like (laughs) the middle of the movie I'm like Hi, little girl. I don't know you. Like, what? Actually, when I went to see, it was last Christmas. I went to see it with my mom and my sister, and it was packed. It was, I think I saw it opening weekend. And then right next to me, there was a little girl, and her mom was next to her. And she had to be probably three or four. She was on her big iPad, and it was like bright, like the brightness was all the way up. But the worst thing was she was watching YouTube videos, and it was some slime videos, and it was all the way the volume up, and the like. I don't know if that was her mother, but I, she just like, she just was completely ignoring that this little girl had the volume completely up. It got so bad because my mom, she spoke to her. She was like, oh, could you lower it? And then the woman, like she said, okay, lower. Like she told the little girl to lower it. She lowered it, but being a little kid, she put it back up. It got so bad that like people at the theater got out and like told the manager of the, of, of the AMC. And then they had to be taken out because it was just like, this woman was just like lowering it a little bit, but then the little girl would rise it back up. And I'm like, like, I just feel like those people, like, are just going to watch it at home because it's probably more convenient for her. She probably didn't have somebody to take care of her little girl. So she mm-hmm. just, like, brought her along. And now, like, you can just watch it at home at the comfort. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a, definitely a case where you're like, clearly this film is not engaging this child. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I, I, it's not doing its job. And if it was a great film, it would entertaining or at least a little bit more you'd hope but uh but yeah no it's true there is definitely a downside to going to the uh, the theaters on the big screen I mean we we definitely don't want it to go away that's kind of my yeah. worry but uh because there's something even like films that aren't like the big grandiose films is there something about being in the audience in, a, in just like a comedy and everybody laughing together yeah. that I think means a lot uh, but yeah, there is also something nice about certain films that I'm like, I'm going to pause now and I'm going to take a little break. <laughs> you can do set your own intermission. Uh, uh, and uh, that that is a plus, I think, of the streaming, especially these long movies like Lord of the Rings or something like that. Very long. <laughs> Yeah, or like just <laughs> movies that have come out on HBO Max, like I think, what's the name? Those Who Wish Me Dead. Like, I thought that movie was fine, but I would mm-hmm. personally not have wanted to pay a ticket to see it at the at the movies, but I just had it with HBO Max and I can just watch a ton of other movies. So I, I just like the idea of choosing. Yeah. But then now with the Suicide Squad, like I do really want to go see that because I love watching comic book movies on the, bin- uh, on the big screen. And yeah, or like with mm-hmm. um, Space Jam, like I haven't seen that one yet, but I like that I can just watch it at my house if I just randomly want to. Yeah, I like the choice. Because there's sometimes when you think, oh, this one will just be average, and then you watch it, and you're like, oh, that was really amazing. That was so mm-hmm. good. Yeah. Uh, but Alon, what do you think about the streaming wars? Uh, I mean, I have what I'm supposed to say, and then I have how I personally <laughs> feel. Yeah. Um, honest, for me, for both personal and professional, I do, I really don't want to see theatrical windows go away. Um, Like I think right now what Paramount was doing with A Quiet Place 2 was it was 45 days exclusive to theaters and then it hit Paramount Plus. I think Universal is doing something similar with their movies and then putting them on the Peacock afterwards. Um, I am not a fan of day and date. Um, uh, There are reports with like with Black Widow and Variety did a bunch and, and, you know, things like that of how actually doing day and date uh, Black Widow made less money for Disney, despite the $30 fee. Um, I would like to still see the support of theatrical windows. I don't think we're ever going to have the like 90 day windows ever again. Um, but I think even moving forward when we are out of this, I hope eventually, <laughs> um, I would I would still like to see, see the support of theatrical windows. There are so many movies that benefit from the big screen. Comedies are one that you mentioned. A lot of genre like a lot of genre films or like exploitation films, like 
I programmed Samurai Cop recently and Hard Ticket to Hawaii. And if you're a first time viewer of those movies, watching them at home is not, is not the same. Those movies are not, uh, you know, those are not rated fresh, right? They have their own charm. I love them, right? But they're, they're, they're known as like, they're bad movies or B movies or whatever, right? But the theater was full of 40 or 50 people laughing at Samurai Cop, but not in a like insulting way in like, I can't believe this happened. Like they only did one take cause they didn't have enough film. So like everything was just one take. Like it's, it's just this amazing communal experience to watch those, those types of older films or older action movies like from the eighties and stuff um, on a big screen. The comic book movies are one. I just saw Suicide Squad last night at an advanced screening. People were laughing, people were clapping like during certain parts of the movie. Like I, I think with streaming, it's very accessible. And I think that is great. There are a lot of people that don't have the money, that don't have the, the ableness to, you know, go to film festivals and travel or, or go to films. And I, I, I think that is great. I think a lot gets lost on streaming because yeah. now all these networks and channels are competing for content. And I didn't even know that Gunpowder Milkshake came out on Netflix already until like people were, were tweeting about it. So I, if things channels get buried, like they bury certain things, they highlight only what they want to highlight, but there's something new every day. And I think a lot of these like indie mid budget films that are already like slowing and kind of going away are, are like, they're getting lost just because there is so much content. And that is very true. There is so much content. I swear a day doesn't go by before somebody tells me to watch, you gotta watch the show. You gotta watch the show. So right. when you throw television into the works, I mean, it's it's uh, it's overwhelming. There is just so much to cover. I mean, just in Christmas movies alone, I, I last year, even with the pandemic, I I watched and reviewed 115 new Christmas movies. And that uh, <laughs> it's like wow, just, like, <laughs> yeah. tiny little genre, you know, like there was so much content. And so it, 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 that is very, very true. There's so much content, but I do think that sometimes that the streaming services are profiling movies that would get ignored in the theater, like documentaries, you know, will get, even if they're somewhat uh, sort of tacky, you know, like Tiger King or something like that, would, will get, will become part of the discussion in a way that wouldn't have happened uh, in previous eras, I think. I, I think, I think that's fair. I just, yeah. I, I think we're entering a qua, uh, a quantity versus quality to, to a degree. Apple TV is clearly curating, right. Mm -hmm. But, uh, others are not yeah. as focused on their. Yeah. Programming. And there really is just so much content. It's unbelievable. This was the first year that I really felt like I had a handle on on television because of the pandemic. That usually, I mean, aside from Hallmark, uh, but most of the time I, I watch the Emmy, I, I look at the Emmys, I'm like, I haven't seen a single one of these shows. <laughs> but this year, actually, I was like, I've seen Ted Lasso, and I've seen The Hacks, and I've seen, I had actually, Bridgerton, I'd seen a bunch of the shows. I was like, ready to go. <laughs> so... Yeah, it's, it's a lot, but <laughs> would you say that you were overall optimistic or worried about the state of film? What do you think, Jennifer? Mm, that's hard. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and say optimistic just because I, I consider myself a pretty optimistic film critic. And like, I, I like a lot of the new films coming out. I haven't seen all the 2021 releases like I haven't seen too many but so far I, I'm I'm liking it I just I just think a lot like I'm just gonna talk about horror movies because that's something that I like I enjoy talking about a lot a lot of horror movies like I was looking at a lot of the ones that are coming out this year and it's a and it's a lot of remakes and reboots and I see that a lot in just movies in general and I'm getting kind of tired of it because I feel like original ideas are just kind of like not being pushed out that much anymore in my opinion and then when something does original does come out like I don't know I just don't think it gets as, as much praise as like these reboots and don't get me wrong I'm excited for like they're doing a Texas Chainsaw reboot 
they're doing the Halloween kills, which I'm excited about. Like, I'm still pumped Candy for them. Man. Yeah, Candyman coming out next month. Yeah. And, like, I'm excited for them, but I don't know. I kind of, like, it's just, like, I, since I've been watching so many old horror movies, it's, like, wow. I wish, like, so many new horror movies were coming out that were just solely new ideas or weren't sequels and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I'm optimistic about everything because I just think, like, there's a lot of, like, new filmmakers that I'm really enjoying but also I just don't like a lot of the trends that's that's happening. And even with streaming services, like I think they're taking advantage of that and putting a lot of reboots and remakes onto their platforms. Like on Disney Plus, I love Marvel and I love everything like everything that they do, but a lot of the content like has just like I just feel like original Disney content is so lacking. I can't remember the last time there's like something that was just original. I think Luca and it didn't even get like a theatrical release. So like it's just I'm I'm optimistic but I'm also just like worried that Hollywood is just going to turn or maybe it already is just like recycling 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 and yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Lauren? Did you say you're optimistic or worried? Uh mine is negative from a theater from a theatrical exhibition standpoint. Um I don't think movies are ever going to go away. Um I think there are I think we'll be seeing a lot more mini series or limited series instead of actual films uh, because of streaming and whatnot and the storytelling that you can do. Um, You know, you couldn't do Lovecraft Country in a two hour movie, two and a half hour movie, you know. Um, So there's there's a lot more storytelling you can do and there's a lot more money, uh, you know, behind Netflix and stuff like that, spending hundreds of millions on Knives Out. Um, so, So there's money there. I'm, I'm just concerned. I was really positive even when the pandemic started. Uh, I mean, I was depressed, sure, but like I was still positive about the future of movie theaters. And, you know, how, how long are we in this now? 15, 18 months, and then they're predicting yeah. another wave, blah, blah, blah. Like, I, I'm less optimistic by the day, and I anticipate more movies that we think are locked in are going to jump. Like, I think Bond is probably going to move. There are rumors that Venom might move, but I don't know if that means up or, you know, if that means like earlier or back. Um, I I had a film professor who's, who's a mentor of mine and he said that movie studios needed movie theaters and they need, pre-pandemic, they needed movie theaters. The issue is movie theaters let the power dynamic switch. And movie theaters were convinced that they needed the movie studios instead. My film professor was like, movie studios should be paying you guys to show their films. You should not be paying them 70% of your ticket sales to show their film. They need you to exhibit their film. And along the way, that power dynamic changed. A lot of it was movie studios saying, well, if you don't give us this percentage of ticket sales, then you can't open the movie at all. And instead of banding together, it was, okay, so you you lose your power in that. Um, but I, I think multiplexes are not going to last for, you know, the next mm-hmm. 5, 10, 20 years. There's just the overhead, uh, you know, having, 20, having to fill 20 or 24 screens when that same content is now available at home. And people are now not wanting to be- venture out even right now, you know, in 2021. So I think, I think the megaplexes are not necessary, are not really going to stay is my yeah. prediction. I worry um, about that for sure. Uh, we'll I think, see, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Like, not, I would say we'll I'm see. on the worried side. I try to be optimistic as well, but, uh, but yeah, it's, I don't know. It's a tricky thing. Cause like, like we said, it's not necessarily the most pleasant experience. So that what are, you know, what are you, what are you like fighting for? Because people are, again, people are talking on their phones. People are talking loudly, making comments. Little girls are sitting next to me talking. (laughs) And theaters theaters have responsibility in that. Um, I, you know, my theater, you get a warning if you're caught on your phone or talking to your neighbor. And then if it happens again, like you have to leave without a refund, Mm -hmm. um, or if it's not crowded, we'll try and maybe move like switch seats, but that's very disruptive, right? We would rather anger two people 
than anger a whole movie theater full of people. So we are, we do try and preserve the movie going experience. And I understand that like we're fortunate and a lot of people don't have that. And I get that, but I mean, with movie, like the theater industry was fighting against theatrical windows, right. With universal and Netflix and things like that and ended up because Netflix wanted like a 28 day, they were like, we'll do a 28 day exclusivity. You can have it for 28 days or something. And the theater industry said, no, like it still has to be 90 days. Like they still were drawing all these hard lines in the sand. And what did they get? They got a seven day exclusivity window. So Mank was on Netflix yeah. in a week. So the oh, theater surprised. has a has yeah. a price. They they have a brunt that they need to bear as well. Like they're responsible. I've been surprised responsible. how well the family films have done like Tom and Jerry and Crudes and uh even Raya like I mean maybe not as well as they would have done before but I thought those would be the hardest hit because they it's a pain out to the theater so I've been surprised how well the family films have done uh over this last year and change because they've been some of the highest performing but I think par- I'm not a parent but we've yeah. parents just you can't poor kids during a lockdown how do you explain to a five-year-old that they can't play with their friend, right? right. So I think parents are do. just looking for something to do. <laughs> and, you know, movie theaters are one of the few places open, right? And there's food, mm-hmm. so. Well, let's end this with talking about our unpopular opinions. Uh, this is something we always talk about in this series. And uh, Jennifer, what did you come up with for an unpopular opinion that you had? Okay, so this is... I think I hope I don't get hate for this, but I'm not the biggest fan of 2001: A Space Odyssey. And every time I've told somebody that, they like freak out. They're like, "What? That movie is a masterpiece." <laughs> and okay, like I can acknowledge that there's obviously good things about it. It's like really well made. But I saw it I think like two years back because I was like, I was like, "Yeah, I'm getting into film. I'm gonna watch all of these masterpieces." And I was really disappointed by it. I just I honestly didn't get it and I, I and I just I just didn't get the hype at all. I was just really disappointed by it and I still to this day like I don't understand why people praise it so much. But yeah. Did you watch it yeah. at home? Yeah. By yourself? No, I actually saw it with my mom and my sister. I was like, let's watch a masterpiece together. And my <laughs> sister was like, why did we watch this? But to be fair, she was like pretty young, so I I don't know why I forced her to watch that. But yeah. No, we all have those "quote unquote" classics that just we just don't like, and that's and the thing totally is, fine. I, I really want to like it. Like I, I am actually like I was outlining some videos that I want to do in some podcast episodes, and I want to give it another chance because I haven't. I've only seen it the one time, and I wonder now that I'm in film school because they've talked really positively about that movie in film school as well. Like if I'll enjoy it a bit more, but then I don't know if I'll enjoy it like because I like it or if it's because like so many voices and so many opinions are like oh it's really good because right. of this this and that so but I, I do want to like it like I want to get why it, it's good like why people enjoy it so much yeah I mean it's a very beautiful movie mm-hmm. I I understand why people it's not one of my favorite I don't dislike it but it's not one of my right. favorite classics uh, it's a it's, it is a little bit slow there's no denying it but I have that same experience with Blade Runner for me Blade Runner is so slow Oh my God. and I love Blade Runner actually I fall asleep every time I try to watch it I've tried like four or five times even in the theater I watched it before 2049 and I fell asleep in both films oh my gosh I feel like I found my people because I can't I've watched Blade Runner twice two different cuts and like loved Blade Runner 2049 loved it cannot stand regular Blade Runner uh Jennifer I saw 2001 for the very first time only two years ago Uh, Uh, but I saw it in a theater on 35 millimeter. And I have to say, like, I was shocked by how into it I was right until like the last 30 minutes or so, you know, where I'm talking about where it like absolutely changes. Yeah. Uh, That's where it happens for a lot of people, but I totally, I don't disagree with you on 2001. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it up until that point, but I do think again, like I saw it in a theater with other people who were fans, 35 millimeter was like quite an experience. Right. Um, but for me, like, I'll I'll throw in a classic in there, Citizen Kane. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's another one of my popular opinions. <laughs> I do not like that movie, 
I respect it. Yeah. I it's an it's a key film to study and there was a lot going on in every frame like Wells was a genius. I do not like that movie and I have seen it more than once and I have it I do not particularly care for it. But that doesn't yep. mean it's not a good movie. <laughs> hot takes. Hot takes. I love it. I love it. Uh, one for me, I, I have a blind spot series that I do every month on my blog where I review a, a, a classic or a cult classic or just something highly praised that people love that I haven't seen. And recently I did Beverly Hills Cop and I thought it was really, really lame. I didn't think it was funny saw your at tweets all. about it. What's that? I saw your tweets about it. Because oh. <laughs> I had recently watched it too for the first time. Yeah, I just didn't, I guess I didn't get it. It just, I I mean, I like Eddie Murphy. I think he can be really funny. I just, I didn't even think, I didn't even see what were like attempts at jokes. Like it was just kind of like a very basic police procedural to me. And I don't know, I just was like, this was really lame. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there you go. What are you going to do? We all oh, have I love them. it. Yes. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I also wasn't a huge fan of Lethal Weapon. So I don't know, something maybe those those '80s action comedies just aren't for me. Oh, okay. See, I and I love '80s action comedies and '80s yeah. action movies. So that's up my. I like Highlander. That was great. Okay. Yeah, that was really good. Should add that. But, uh, but sometimes it's just about finding the right classic for you. And and every I always say be very skeptical of the critic who. Uh, is praises everything and it's always on sort of the popular opinion side and be very critical I mean very skeptical of the constant cynic the person who's always tearing everything down and hating on everything like to me both of those that's not like a critic a critic gives critical analysis of of the film so they by nature are going to like certain things and dislike certain things and uh, so otherwise they're not really doing their job they're just kind of performing entertainment uh, and ranting and raving or, uh, and that's not what, that's not a critic, that's an entertainment. Uh, but the last question that I always ask is, what is something that you have done that you are proud of, whether on your channel or just uh, in, uh, that you think it was good writing or good, uh, or good editing, whatever you want to climb, something that you created that you're proud of. What about you, Jennifer? So something that I am really proud of, I actually just did about like two weeks ago and it was my 24 hour movie challenge. And I love the way I edited that video so much. And a lot of people also told me, which is like, I love getting complimented on my editing because I love editing, like I've already said, but it was so much fun. And I want to do so many of those again, like film challenges. Like I love that so much. And, I, and I'm trying to do a lot more like topic videos like I keep saying like um somebody requested that I do a video where like for an entire week I watch like a very specific niche like romance type of movies and then I talk about that and like I'm just really proud of that because like first of all I can't believe I stayed up for technically like 22 hours because I cheated and I was like I'm out of it so I'm just gonna go to sleep but like I pretty much completed it and I watched a lot of pretty good movies and I made a cool video out of it like a lot of people were saying it looked like a documentary and like that was cool like I yeah I just I'm proud of that like I really had fun with that video I watched some good movies and I had a lot of fun having doing the different editing style because sometimes when I do my videos like the editing could feel very like it's just it's just the same over and over again like it's me talking in front of a camera and then I put movie clips but then for this one I got to film some b-roll do different angles and just kind of play around with it which I had a lot of fun doing oh, that's, I saw that I haven't had a chance to watch it yet but it looked interesting uh that I think that would be a that would be a fun challenge uh, to do what about you Lauren what would you say um, so I, I don't admittedly, uh, I, I don't have a YouTube channel and I don't, I don't really write reviews except, uh, like my little letterboxd. uh, letterbox I do and like Twitter and like, I've got some, like some Facebook ones that I was doing where I would do like a movie poster and I would rate it based on enjoyment versus, uh, like technical achievement, right? Like a lot mm -hmm. of five-star movies, right? Like Jennifer, like you can get the 2001's five stars, but enjoyment might be more like two yeah. stars, right? And I think that's, yeah, yeah important. Um, but honestly, there was an event in 2019, 
uh, where uh, the, the, the people of, uh, can I, I, can I name drop? Sorry. Like I, yeah, I just work it. with a lot of like, sorry. Yeah, uh, please. So uh, Todd McFarland, the creator of Spawn, uh, his people had reached out to us because he was in the record books for longest running comic book series that was like, uh, like individually owned, right? Like it wasn't, Marvel didn't own it. Like he owned it and it was the lo longest running comic book series. His people had reached out to us to do a special signing, um, which he doesn't usually do outside of like New York Comic Con and things like that. And they reached out to us with a two week window. So we had two weeks to put together this massive like meet and greet event. And this was sort of back during my field producing days. Cause when I was at the weather channel, I did a lot of field producing um, from like people on remote locations or people would come to the weather channel parking lot, you know, like storm chasers and things like that. And it was putting together, you know, like a live show. So I got to sort of tap into that. And um, with, you know, a lot of help from my team, we ended up doing this massive like outdoor, uh, outdoor event and meet and greet that would come through one of our lobbies uh, with over a thousand people in one day um, came through and like we had a special menu and we did a special we did some we did some screenings of the film spawn from Warner Brothers um, so it just to put together something that large in two weeks and you know promote it and get the word out and and have people have such a lovely like experience most of whom had never been you know, to our place of business before was really, um, was really exhilarating and just really, really exciting and stressful, but I loved it. <laughs> that's great. I love those kinds of experiences. And that's one thing that the, uh, the, the digital festival experience can't quite, uh, quite match is that yeah. sense of when you have those kind of moments at, at a festival or at a, you know, of, of gathering in the community sense it it, uh, it can give some of it but not quite the same as that experience of all celebrating a film together it's really great well one thing i wanted to talk about that i'm proud of is this last uh coverage of sundance i i live in utah so i i covered sundance for a long time i love sundance and uh, they just knocked it out of the park this year with the digital festival they really thought of everything and it was so well done and i thought their slate was so good at films there were so many it was honestly a lot better than the previous year than 2020 uh where which i attended in person i there were just not a lot of great movies that year but this year there were a lot of really good ones in my opinion but what I did for my coverage is I interviewed all of the animation uh, shorts directors uh, that I ended up doing 10 interviews. And it was a ton of work because you have to, it's actually way harder to do a print interview than to do a podcast interview because you have to transcribe everything. And that takes so much more work than just editing. And it was a ton of work, but it was a really satisfying experience because I got to give all of these small animators who, you know, are just doing shorts. A lot of them are just out of college. A lot of them are, uh, you know, in uh, foreign countries. So I got to meet a lot of really interesting, cool people uh, in Sweden and Thailand and and Australia and all over the place. And it was just a great experience. I'm doing ten interviews uh and over the course of the festival and and that's in addition to i think i watched and reviewed 25 films so it was incredibly busy and incredibly stressful time but i was so proud of every single one of them and uh, i i thought the whole series turned out really nice i was a little bummed that both of the feature animation directors didn't respond to our uh requests because that would have made it perfect if we'd had every single animated director in the series. But alas, uh, it was still, I thought, a pretty great series and a nice way to help people that are, you know, making these small shorts and just getting started in their career. So that's something I'm proud of that we did. And that's over at rotoscopers.com. People can take a look at the, um, uh, the Indymation series that we did uh, for Sundance. So. Oh, I love that. I definitely will. I think animation is underappreciated as well. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, it's my favorite uh, medium of uh, 
of movies. And it's been such a great year for animation in 2021 because people were able to do so much of it at home. So it's it's a it's a been a really cool year with things like Raya and Mitchell's vs. Machines and uh, we're just going to have Vivo coming out in a few weeks. So I'm really happy about a Luca, uh, where we're at in animation in 2021. But, uh, so, well, thank you so much to both of you for coming and, uh, having this conversation. It was a lot of fun. I really loved getting to know both of you. And, and, uh, so, uh, Lauren, how can people find you and follow you on social media, all that fun stuff? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd at That Movie Is Fine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jennifer, what about you? You guys can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Jennifer V Movies. And I'm also on Letterboxd. It's just at Jennifer Vega. Great. And you can find me at Rachel's Reviews, all of our social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes. And then also make sure you check out the Hallmarkies podcast. We have a ton of fun over there. And uh, thanks so much to both of you. And let us know your comments uh, in the comment section. And we would love to hear that or on Twitter. And uh, we'll talk to you all later. Bye, everyone. Bye.